Hi there. I'm Mike Larson, Editor-in-Chief at Money Show, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to Gene Munster, Managing Partner and Co-Founder at Deepwater Asset Management, formerly known as Loop Ventures. Gene is going to be joining us in New York for our upcoming symposium. Um, prior to Deepwater, Gene was the Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst at Piper Jaffray, where he covered technology companies including Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Uh, over his 21-year tenure, Mr. Monster has received many acknowledgments, including top stock picker from Forbes, best on the street from the Wall Street Journal, and is widely recognized for his work on key tech stocks like Apple. So, Gene, welcome to this interview. I appreciate you taking some time out. Great to be here. Thank you. All right, let's take things from the proverbial top first. Uh, we all know it's been a tough environment for the tech sector and tech investors in most of 2022. Um, we have seen some marquee names try to stabilize now and turn higher, uh, but the news flow has tended to be negative. Since that. So if you look at from a, a 36,000 foot up uh, you know, view, what do you see driving this market action and where do you see things going this year? There's two levers. Uh, the first is the one that we've been through, tech companies have been through, tech stocks have been through, most importantly over the last nine months. And that of course is the interest rate. As those interest rates go up, that makes it easier to make money in a safe place, your money in the bank. It makes it uh, less attractive to invest in companies that are further out from their profitability. And that most likely would be a tech company. So we've uh, seen that compression. If you look at broader, some of the big tech in the last nine months, they're down 30%. If you look at some of the emerging tech, on average, down 70%. So this has not been a good year for tech. The past 12 months has not been a good year. There's a second layer to the conversation as we get through mm -hmm. some of the shock around interest rates, which is what's going to happen with the fundamentals. And I think uh, you have uh, started to see is this earnings period is going to be a mixed bag. I think it's uh, at risk of being more messy. And uh, I think uh, Microsoft's outlook is an indication on that. And so we are still grappling with ultimately what does that curve look like in terms of uh, what the growth rate is going to be, how these growth rates from these tech companies are going to bottom in the months ahead. So that's the near term. That's why tech has not been a good place to be. I am uh, a, a forward thinker, and <laughs> I also believe in a pendulum effect here too. When the pendulum is so far on the side of what I believe is negativity, there's an opportunity for it to shift more positive in the months ahead, the quarters ahead, and the years ahead. So ultimately, I think that this is a good time to be investing in tech. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the near term, and then we'll shift to that far term and some of the underlying technologies, which I think are very important. Uh, I saw a recent CNBC appearance that you had, and you referenced that this wave of tech layoffs, and that you think we'll probably see more of them this year. Uh, when does that that news flow dry up, in your opinion? Is that something first quarter, second quarter? We're not going to get through this till you know the back half of the year. How do you see that playing out? I think it'll uh, play out by the middle of the year, and it's going to take one of two forms. One is we're going to hear about more headcount reductions from some of these larger tech companies and, and uh, all tech companies for that uh, sake. Second is you will see just a slowdown in hiring and just let natural yeah. attrition uh, lower the overall headcount. And if you look at a typical uh, tech employee, their uh, tenure is usually just a little bit under 10 years. So you call it 12% annual uh, churn mm -hmm. in their workforce. So there's a, a large lever that doesn't capture headlines just as they can slow down the hiring and just let people kind of uh, find their way off of their payroll. And I think when you put all this together, what does this come down to? Is that whether it's through uh, headline grabbing uh, for their layoffs or it's through attrition, I think most companies still need to reduce their workforce by 15 to 20 percent. And uh, I think we'll probably uh, see more of that throughout this, uh, you know, the next couple uh, quarters. But probably by the end of the year, these workforces should be right sized. Got it. Now, again, let, 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 like I said, let's shift a little bit to some of the underlying technologies. I mean, I, I looked at some of your work recently and, and some of the think pieces that you've put up on your website have covered the chat GPT phenomenon, what it means for companies like Google, uh, new chip announcements from Apple. And I think your quote was that speed is the gift that keeps on giving there. Uh, and also what's next in batteries. Um, I assume those are some of the topics that you might also be covering in New York. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those technologies and what opportunities they offer investors. Uh, the one you can't stop talking about is GPT that is, uh, you know, effectively like a carnival trick. Uh, they've only <laughs> disclosed that they have a million users. I suspect that the number is much higher, probably greater than 200 million at this point. People have tried it at least. Uh, people try it. Most people have, a lot of people have tried it. 
but uh, people rarely come back and try it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. They're impressed by it, but that utility piece really hasn't been unlocked. And so I think that that's going to be an opportunity for not only Microsoft to unlock 70% of their products can have some sort of uh, impact from chat GPT as they integrate that. But also when Google comes out with their response, which is likely going to be by uh, before summer, uh, mm -hmm. they will probably integrate some more real time. So we're going to talk about that impact and, and uh, impact on other companies as essentially the AI phenomenon gets closer to general intelligence. Yeah. We'll talk about that spectrum of how AI improves and what's the prospect of getting to super intelligence and what is the impact if we do get to super intelligence. So that's uh, one uh, theme we'll be discussing. We're also going to be talking about uh, the metaverse and uh, you know what is the metaverse ultimately <laughs> and why is it something that uh, we believe is going to be front and center to our daily lives in the next decade. Uh, of course, there is uh, considerable controversy around whether or not uh, the metaverse will actually take root or this is something that is a flash in the pan and will fade, yeah. but that's, a, uh, I think, an, an important topic. And then uh, another piece is just uh, we'll be discussing on the, the chip side uh, that is, uh, or uh, with uh, chips is related to onshoring and how more technology is being brought to the U.S. and what some of the investment opportunities around that are. And then the last piece around batteries, really exciting space. It sounds boring, but it is <laughs> exciting. And uh, specifically around greater yields, everything from electric car uh, batteries for EVs to uh, grid scale uh, batteries. And uh, those are batteries used by energy companies as they start to harness more renewable energy and apply that at different times of the day. And so those are four big uh, topics that are going to be front and center in the tech conversation in the next year. And that's what we're going to talk about in New York. Awesome. Awesome. You know, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I did want to touch on something. I mean, I mentioned at the outset, you had rebranded your firm as Deepwater Asset Management. And the idea is sort of a, recognizing a contrarian investing, Ben, your willingness to find opportunities where other investors might not you know, be willing to go or, or be too fearful to venture. I guess if you take that, that uh, approach, where do you think that applies right now? I mean, what's one of, I don't know, your top contrarian ideas right here? Or where do you think investors uh, are really kind of ignoring the opportunities just because they're, they're too fearful of the risks at this point? Well, we're going to talk about some of those in New York. Uh, one I would mention is uh, the company Meta. Uh, this is one that is, uh, they've spent a sizable amount, 20% of their annual spending is on the metaverse. And there is, uh, as we talked about, a, a belief by many investors that this will not yield any opportunities. But uh, this is uh, an example of a company that is one of our larger positions. It is a contrarian view. Uh, we're not as concerned about TikTok, and we'll talk more about that in New York. All right, awesome, Gene. Well, I appreciate that preview. I know our viewers do too. Um, so thank you very much for your insights. Uh, and everyone, thank you for watching. I hope you did enjoy this interview. If you did, you're going to love seeing experts like Gene in person. You're going to get the chance to ask them questions about their investing approach, interact with some of the smartest people in finance um, at our gala symposium in New York. So please do click the link in the video description below. You can find out more details about how you can be in the room for the symposium. Thanks again, Gene, and thank you for watching. Thank you.